Welcome to today's State of the Field Structural Health Monitoring Application to Bridge Projects Experience from Louisiana. We're excited to host Professor Ayman O'Kill, who's um, he's going to share his, his practitioner and academic experience. My name is John Patinos. I'm a project manager at the C2 Smart Center. We are a USDOT designated Tier 1 University Transportation Center and tasked with taking the recent advances in big data and technology and applying them to today's most pressing urban mobility challenges, one of which you'll he hear about today. In this series, the regular state of the field series, we're aiming to bridge the gap between the best of research and the state of the practice. And we'll share the latest advances, opportunities, predictions, research bottlenecks, and the perspectives and skills that are needed from researchers and the workforce of tomorrow towards tackling one of today's most pressing problems in mobility. Just a few questions to start. As you might have seen, we're gonna be recording this session and uploading it to the C2 Smart Center YouTube channel. Definitely want to encourage you to participate in this event through um, question and answers to our presenter today. You can do so by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And I think with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Hani Nassif, who is the Associate Director of Technology Transfer here at the C2 Smart Center and leader of the center's own structural health monitoring efforts right here in Brooklyn, New York. Thank Professor you, Nassif. Hard. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction for the center. Uh, we've been, as you know, active in this uh, state of the field uh, series on structural health monitoring. I want to thank you and the center for supporting this effort. Uh, we had a series of speakers over the last year, and uh, we will be concluding kind of a, uh, the, uh, the series by a, a session in, in May, most likely at May 20th. We're trying to get a, a panel of the speakers together. So the dates are still not uh, finalized, but I would say it will be around uh, the, the, the last week of May and, and I will send announcements uh, pretty soon. Uh, but I just wanna emphasize that the center has really tried a, a, to bring this uh, state of the art or state of the practice and structural health monitoring into implementation. Uh, this, the center has had a uh, uh, urban uh, kind of test bed for this uh, on, the, on the Brooklyn Queen Expressway, as you know, where we have uh, in, in, in collaboration with the New York City DOT and uh, the joint venture uh, Parsons and ACOM, we've been able to put together a, a, a kind of a field test bed on, on how different sensors, modern sensors, fiber optic, all the type of structural health monitoring technologies and test them and, and bring back uh, a, a practical solution for that. And, and so today I, I wanted to invite uh, my friend and my colleague, uh, Dr. Ayman Alkail, because he's been at the forefront of this implementation. Uh, in uh, Professor, just to introduce him, uh, he's been uh, involved in structural health monitoring for quite some time. Uh, I was, uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the panel uh, for their NSF uh, a project to uh, develop a curriculum for undergraduate students to work on structural health monitoring, uh, which was a wonderful uh, endeavor to work with them on it. And it's now uh, implemented. I think Dr. Okay will mention something on that. He's also uh, involved in the uh, area of using advanced composites, uh, using reliability-based approach for code calibration. Uh, and, and also, uh, as, as it, it says there, he's the uh, PE, a licensed uh, professional engineer in the state of Florida. And uh, um, he is also established as a distinguished professor by having the Roe Daniels uh, chair in his department. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Ayman. Ayman, go ahead, please, and get started. Thank you. Thanks, Hani. Thanks, John, for the introduction um, uh, and for the invitation to uh, present uh, my work uh, to your center and to the audience that are with us today. Uh, as uh, was mentioned before, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, my experience in structural health monitoring and uh, bridge applications. And uh, Hani asked me also to maybe at the end uh, bring to your attention this NSF project about introducing structural health monitoring and undergraduate education. So this is basically the outline that we will uh, uh, go over today uh, briefly, of course, uh, with the time limits that we have. So there will be three projects that uh, I was involved in uh, 
uh, applying structured health monitoring technologies uh, in, and uh, then we have the NSF project uh, on education uh, towards the end. So let's start with the structured health monitoring applications. Uh, the motivation for the first and the second project was uh, to eliminate uh, bridge joints. So we know that bridge joints, uh, uh, you know, on the face of it, uh, looks like a good idea, uh, but uh, there are problems that are associated with them in uh, in practice. So they lead to Basically, they don't last the, the, the entire length of the bridge, so you have to spend a lot of uh, uh, money on the maintenance of them. Not only that, there is always deterioration close to the uh, joint uh, because of the leaks that happen through these joints that go and damage the ends of the girders or the bent caps. In addition to the riding quality, when you go over a bridge with many joints, then you're going to feel the bump. So the idea is to eliminate these joints. Now, how do you do that? Well, you just establish continuity. Easier said than done. Uh, continuity, again, on the face of it, uh, you know, sounds like an easy and good thing to do, but there are challenges. Uh, people say you achieve longer span lengths. Yes, in some systems you can, but uh, how to achieve that? For precast, pre-stressed girders is not always an easy thing. There was an NCHRP project 1253 and a few more before that, that looked into how states establish continuity. And um, the continuity issue is not related to the maximum moment that happens at the joint, which is a negative moment. Uh, negative moments is not a big deal. If you just have some concrete between the girder ends, then they are gonna be pushing on the bottom of this diaphragm and you are gonna get your continuity. The deck will be in tension. But the problem is when you have positive moments, which can happen because the live load is sitting on a far away span from your joint, then you start getting positive moments like you see here at the bottom. And this positive moment will lead to compression at the top of the joint and at the bottom, you have tension. Now, how do you resist this tension? That's the million dollar question. So the NCHRP project looked into ways of doing this. Another reason for developing this positive moment is the uh, long-term effects like creep and shrinkage and uh, thermal gradients, all of these things over time cause the girders to camber up. And if this overcomes what the self weight uh, causes downward, then you're gonna end up with a positive moment. That's why they are uh, recommending in the uh, NCHRP project to have the girders sit down 90 days so that you can get most of the creep out of the system. Of course, not all of it, you will still have some creep, but uh, this is going to cause the tension at the bottom. The bottoms of the girders want to move away from each other. You have to bring them back and that's what the positive moment resistance is going to come from. What you cannot do much about is the temperature gradient. Temperature gradient causes the same kind of camber because the deck top will be heated more than the bottom of the girder. And there's not much you can do. You can sit the girder out for creep to get it out of the system. But what are you going to do about temperature gradient? Uh, not much, especially in a place like Louisiana, where it gets very hot during uh, the summer months of July and August. So let's look at the first project. Uh, it's uh, one of eight bridges in the John James Audubon uh, project that uh, uh, was uh, basically bid as a design build project. And the, uh, uh, the design build team decided to use one of these uh, recommendations in the Miller report for the NCHRP project that I mentioned. There are two ways of doing this. Either you extend the strands from the ends of the girders and then bend them up into the concrete diaphragm, or you can add some additional hairpin bars uh, that stick out of the girder ends for the same purpose. So uh, the John James Audubon uh, Bridge is not far away from where I am now. It's about 35, 40 miles uh, away from here. So basically in our backyard, we cross the river, the Mississippi River, and it's gonna be the major crossing. We are not talking about this major bridge. We're talking about one of the other seven bridges in this project on the other side is called bridge number two. 
and uh, uh, this is the uh, where the, we instrumented the bridge to investigate this hairpin detail. Just a plug for our uh, cable state bridge in our backyard. This is uh, the bridge during construction. It has been completed many years ago, and it's a it's a beauty to to look at. And we have these nice uh, orange cables that uh, uh, suspended. Uh, all right. So the issue with this that triggered this project is that the uh, the designer of the bridge decided to use this hairpin detail that you see on the left, which is not what Louisiana historically used. If you look at the Louisiana Bridge Design Manual, this is the old one, we have a new one now. It doesn't have this positive moment uh, sticking, uh, reinforcement sticking out. Actually, it had a bond breaker uh, at the ends. So there is a continuity diaphragm, but the continuity diaphragm basically is not connected to the girder. It just hugs them, but the girder, in case there is compression, yeah, it's gonna uh, kick into the diaphragm. But if there is tension at the bottom, then it's supposed to be able to move. So there is this positive full continuity detail that you see here. There is the uh, bridge design manual. And then there is a third option that I will talk about in the next project, which is called the link slab option. So as I said, the project designer chose to use the NCHRP uh, detail. And that's why uh, the DOTD said it's an opportunity to look at how it performs. And this is what we did. This is the cross section of the bridges, a very typical uh, deck on girders, it happened to be about T72 inches here. And uh, the hairpin bars were number five bars sticking out of the ends of these girders. Where you have continuity. They chose a skewed span because uh, if, if you look at the NCHRP report, they did not consider uh, skewness at all, and uh, therefore this was the choice. The, uh, the railway track that you see here is what uh, imposed this uh, uh, skewed configuration for the bridge. So we, of course, we wanted to instrument everything, but you have a budget and you're limited, so we decided to look at uh, two uh, positive moment continuity joints, uh, and we instrumented them with uh, embedded sensors. We focused on the hairpin bars. So we had strand meters that clamp onto the hairpin bar uh, itself. We also had some at the top. And then at mid span, because we wanted to see how the continuity affects the creep and shrinkage and uh, even live load, as I will say in a second, uh, so these were the embedded sensors. We also had surface mounted sensors to complement what's embedded in these girders. So we had strain gauges, we had tilt meters, the blue ones here are tilt meters. And then we also had a gap meter that uh, measures the relative movement between the bottoms of the girders. If this joint is working well, then they should be moving more or less the same, or the movement would represent the strain and the steel that uh, happens to cross this area. So by these sensors, we can capture a lot of things like girder end rotation strains of the hairpin bars, which means I can figure out how much force these bars are resisting. And therefore I can estimate the moment that develops in these girders. Uh, we have uh, strains uh, on the pre-stressing strains as well. And then we have the uh, gap between the girder ends. Installation is a typical thing. You have to go to the casting yard and start putting your embedded sensors there. And the key to success here is coordination, coordination, coordination. You should not leave anything for any uh, surprises. Uh, and there will be surprises. Uh, you go there and maybe they poured it because they were ready the day before or something of that sort. So you have to be on top of things and talk to everybody. Uh, the uh, Surface mounted sensors, um, it's, it's a, always a challenge because as you can see on the left here, the skewness of the diaphragm relative to the girder makes you know, these areas, tight areas hard to reach, but it's still doable. Remember that you will be flying up maybe 40, 50 feet up in the air to do all of these things. So safety is also an issue. Now to get the relative move between the girder ends, we had to improvise here. So there is no way of passing the 
uh, the sensor, which is this long rod that you see here through the diaphragm, the diaphragm is there. And the way we got into this project was after it was bid and they started construction. So we're trying to catch up. So we improvised and we have this L-shaped brackets that go and basically bypass the diaphragm and it goes underneath the diaphragm here. So these things are solutions that you have to come up with when you start implementing these sensors. We collected data from when the girders were uh, sitting in the casting yard to meet the, uh, the age that is required before they move them to the uh, bridge site. And when the system was complete, we had a solar panel. There is no power in, on this bridge, solar panel to power our system, and we're collecting all our data uh, uh, remotely. So this is a typical reading that you would get uh, from one of the sensors. We had about maybe 70 sensors in this project. Uh, there are blackout dates, things happen, and you have a, uh, basically, uh, maybe the solar panel is not working anymore, the battery needs to be replaced, it's got to remember these are years of service and not just uh, a few uh, days. And uh, of also here at the beginning, we had a blackout date, that's between the uh, service and the, uh, uh, the, the recordings at the casting yard versus when the bridge was completed and ready for us to install our remaining sensors. From this, you can see that there are daily fluctuations in the readings. And the reason we have these daily fluctuations is because of temperature changes. Uh, we also have seasonal changes. So between let's say summer or beginning of summer and winter, there are changes that take place. And then when you get back to the summer again, you will not get back to the original uh, datum that you started with simply because we have uh, uh, permanent strain changes that's due to creep or whatever else that causes it. We have to process all the data. So you get your data that looks like this and it has so many um, outliers. These are because of lightning or because of glitches in the system. So once you clean it, you're going to get a clean uh, record like what you see over here. Another thing that uh, not many people emphasize is that you have to temperature correct your uh, strain readings. These are two different types of gauges um, that are at the same location. And you can see that there is a huge difference between the readings from both of them. Uh, so why is that the case? Well, because you have to basically read the manual and uh, not both of them are uh, affected by the ambient temperature at the same level. So once you correct them, you get something that is very similar. So it's a major step that if you take the raw readings at the face value, you may be looking at something else. So I'm gonna emphasize Two things here, I'm gonna emphasize the temperature readings and just to give you an idea of what Louisiana looks like. So during the summer, you'll see that the top sensor is uh, about 110, 115 degrees. That's the temperature that we're recording. But the top of the girder, it is less, maybe around 100. And if you're going to the bottom of the girder, then you're talking about something that is less than 100. And I want to emphasize here that this deck sensor is not at the very top of the deck. This, is, this was installed on the bottom mesh of the uh, deck reinforcement. So you still have about maybe five inches above it that are gonna be much hotter than that because of the direct sun uh, rays uh, hitting the deck. We measured the difference and it's between 20 or maybe 18 to 25, just in these top four or five inches. So if you're looking at the difference between these are the readings from the deck sensor to the bottom sensor. You see that we're getting maybe 15 degrees here. Now remember that for the top of the deck, the very surface that we drive on, there is another maybe 15, 20 degrees on top of that. That's a huge temperature gradient that dominated uh, basically the performance as I will show you in a sec. One girder was an anomaly because we didn't get this, we got actually negative gradient. And this is something that you have to look at the site and the orientation of the bridge and, and the geography and all of these things. It's an exterior girder, girder number five. And because of the sun, 
you, your uh, barrier is basically shading the top of the girder and the sun is hit directly hitting the bottom of the girders. That's why this one is completely different. We tested the bridge uh, uh, for uh, live loads. Under live load, we just got two uh, trucks that were filled and the trucks were basically put in tandem. Uh, so you have two side by side, slightly shifted because of the skewness of the bridge uh, for positive moments. And then we had for negative moment, the two trucks that were uh, one ahead of the other. And uh, one of the readings or one of the purposes of this was to see if the joint is capable of uh, basically transferring the load and the moment from one side to the other. So when you have the trucks in a positive case, let's say at mid span of this inter intermediate span or middle span, then the strain that is on the hairpin on the outside span was recording some negative readings. Why am I saying it's negative here? Because this test takes a long time to run. Vibrating wire gauges, which is the technology that we used for this project, is slow. And uh, to run over all the sensor and record it, then it will take a while. And if you want to get more than one reading, then it will have to sit there for maybe 10, 15 minutes to get three, four readings out of every sensor. So it takes a while. As we are waiting for all these positions, the temperature is going up for the entire bridge and that's affecting the readings as well. So we asked the trucks to leave the uh, segment that we are testing here and when they are leaving, these are the uh, big red circles. This is considered our adjusted datum, basically. So as you can see, when we have the truck, the two trucks sitting on this middle span, we're getting a negative reading, even though it's positive, but it's negative compared to the uh, adjusted datum that we're talking about. When we move the, uh, the truck to these, this third span, which is two spans away from our gauge that we're talking about here on the hairpin bar. What did we get? We get positive strains. That's an indication that there is positive moment like circuit analysis shows, but it's a very small value. Uh, it is not something that one would worry about. What would the case be that causes the maximum effect? Well, if you have the two trucks sitting on the first and second, that's a negative moment case, and you can see that's a much higher strain. So what is the conclusion from this? This joint is capable of transferring the loads and moments and it behaves as a continuous structure as intended. One of the things that bothered us for a while is that girder number three strains were uh, basic, basically they all of a sudden shut up more than what other girders were uh, showing. So the other girders maybe were more than 100 micro strains, but this one we got into 600 and 800 micro strains. Something that is alarming, we checked our code, we checked our data just to make sure what is going on that is causing something like this. We couldn't find anything in our end that is causing this to happen. So we went and inspected the bridge. This was in May. The system was completed in January of 2009. In May, we went to inspect it and here you go, we found the first crack of the girder, and this is girder number three. So this is the bottom flange of the girder. Here's the bracket that I told you about to pass the, uh, the uh, gap meter gauge uh, underneath the diaphragm, which is skewed, as you can see here. And the crack was not uh, all the way through the bottom flange, but the flange showed some cracks. We went there. Uh, after uh, a year, and guess what? Now the bridge is open to traffic, by the way, and the entire track or entire bottom flange was cracked all the way. That's why we had the spike, because now the cross section is behaving as if it's just a reinforced, cracked, reinforced concrete section, not a, a, an intact uh, pre stressed concrete section at this location. So we informed the duty about this and they went and asked the contractor to do something about it just to prevent corrosion of the reinforcement. And they did that with some type of epoxy. This epoxy, uh, as you can see here, when we visited in February of 2012, 
you couldn't see the crack. Uh, it was like under whatever they put on there. But then the very first summer after that, guess what? The crack occurred again because it's a brittle material that they have used. Temperature gradients are going to happen. It's going to open and close and it cracked again. We went and looked at other girders and there were many of this similar type of crack. So what is happening here? Well, as I said, the reinforcement is basically passing the force. The force cannot pass from the girder from one side to the other directly. It has to go through the diaphragm and the diaphragm is going to pass this to the reinforcement on the other side of the girder. So we built a finite element model and we included like the core joint between the diaphragm and the girder. And as you can see here, once it's subjected to a positive moment, the core joint is not going to help you because basically it's going to open up. Of course, we get, we're exaggerating the deformation. So there is there will be a gap. So what is the only thing that is passing the force? It's going to be the hairpin bars at the bottom between the girder ends. So if you look at the stress concentrations, you'll find that there is a lot of stress concentration at the bottom of the girders, the bottom flange. and this can lead to high tensile stresses and the, the tensile stresses are what causes the crack. What doesn't help here is that the pre-stressing is not effective yet. If you're talking about a few inches into the girder, the transfer length is still at the beginning. So the pre-stressing is not fully effective. If you go in three feet maybe in, into the girder, then you're starting to get the compression. So it's a, basically a vulnerable uh, area for these things to happen. So this was the project with fault continuity. The DUTD, uh, uh, because they come from the other detail, which didn't have the uh, fault continuity there, they wanted to explore uh, having a, what we call a link slab. And the link slab system was tested on this other bridge, uh, uh, the Washita uh, River Bridge. It's a, it's a very long bridge, uh, about over 3,000 feet, and uh, it crosses uh, the Washington River with uh, some steel spans that you can see part of over here. But we are focusing on the pre-stress concrete girders. Now, the span lengths were 135. The segments were mainly two span segments, but some of them were four span segments. One of them was. They were just trying to test if we can go with this link slab a little bit longer, how far can we go? And uh, it's a typical, again, typical uh, deck over girders and the girders were also bulk tees here. Uh, I don't think new projects will have bulk tees because now Louisiana has its um, new LG girders, like many states are starting to develop their own cross sections. And uh, that's what the detail looks like. So we don't have a continuity diaphragm, we have two end diaphragm, at the ends of the girders. And then the deck, instead of having a joint that separates these two, the deck is continuous over the, uh, over the joint. So the difference is they use this span or, or this bridge as a test bed. So basically we, we tried so many things. We tried having one of these diaphragms to go all the way down and to be anchored into the bent cap or to be floating, just you know, no connection, just sitting on the bank. Louisiana is not a seismic uh, state, except for maybe very uh, small area in the Northeast. So it's, it's not now. What I'm saying here may not be possible for other states that have larger uh, uh, seismic forces. So it's just sitting on these bearing pads and with no connection. Uh, that's what we call a floating span, basically. Uh, and then, as you know, as recommended by some people, we decided to use like a notch to try to arrest the crack that happens at the top of the deck, the uh, joint uh, the, the, in the link slab, and uh, to see if it's really going to be able to arrest the crack and it happens under the sealant, or uh, can we just leave it? Because that's an extra step that maybe. Uh, we can be eliminated. So it's a crack control detail. Again, we used embedded sensors. We use surface mounted sensors. Um, we increased the number of sensors here this time to measure the uh, relative movement between the girder ends. 
um, because this project was uh, uh, actually part of the, it was a change order for the contractor. So they did what we asked for this time. The other one we were trying to catch up because it happened after the fact. So we asked, for example, for uh, uh, leaving uh, holes in the diaphragm so that we can pass our sensors uh, through them to get the relative movement between the girder ends that you see over here. And we have another one at this level. We have the bottom of the girder, but the bottom of the girder, we, we did it relative to the bent cap itself. So we get from this a lot of information. These are the segments. Segment A is the four span floating segment. We call it floating. It's not on water or anything. It's just on the bearing pads. And we, uh, we just uh, uh, implemented as such. And then we have the other two segments. Some of them are anchored. Some of them are not. Some of them were, had stainless steel in the uh, reinforcement for the link slab. Again, we were trying to test things. Some of them with the uh, crack control detail, some of them without the crack control detail. So all kinds of sensors, strand meters, tilt meters. And then we have the gaps at the top of the web that I showed you before, the bottom of the web, and then relative to the bent cap. We also ran live load tests on this on these uh, segments, uh, not just one segment like the other project, but on all of them because they had different configurations. And we were looking at basically the relative displacement beginning and end of one of these segments because again, the, uh, the idea is if you have a very long segment and temperature, you don't have a joint, temperature is gonna hit it, then you may get uh, um, excessive movements, and that was not the case, as I will show you in a second. Relative angle between the girder ends, because now the bottoms are free. So how much is this relative angle is something that we also looked at, and then the force in the length slab. So this is uh, just uh, one of the cases. This is a the force span segment, and I'm looking at the length force slab, uh, length slab force that is uh, the red, uh, basically, uh, highlighted uh, plot over here. And then we have the deformation between the beginning and end of one of the spans to see if the bearings can take this movement and then the relative angle. And depending on the position of the truck, uh, whether you're talking about a positive one or a negative one, this affected our readings. The thing is that the force that uh, is in the link slab is not a huge force compared to what the reinforcement can really take. So we're talking about 10 kipple forces that is caused by the uh, live load effect. And then you keep moving it. Once you leave that effect, this is going to be less effective in transferring these far away loading cases to whatever you're measuring because you don't have full continuity. You just have partial continuity just in the deck. So it's stiffness is much less and therefore it cannot pass. If you're talking about negative moments, then you have the same effect. Remember that here, for example, this relative angle, which is on the end of the two loaded spans, once you have these two trucks move to be on either side of this thing, then you are doubling this end rotation almost that you can see over here. And then if it moves beyond that, then it goes back to make as if one truck is only affecting it. So what we're trying to say here is that with link slabs, you're more effective by what is acting on these spans, not by what is acting on the faraway span. And the other conclusion that we uh, came up with here is that whatever you're measuring from live load is small compared to what temperature causes. Temperature causes like 60 kip of force, and then live load is just 20 kipple force. Same thing for relative uh, uh, angles. So we're talking about 0 0.02 degrees and here we're talking about 0 0.0045 degrees. Um, so we made our recommendations. Partial continuity is a better detail. You don't have the stress concentrations and that's what is uh, now uh, implemented in the new bridge design manual. Ashto, I believe uh, T10 has added this as one of the options to uh, continuity in bridge spans. The last project I'm going to talk about is the uh, culvert project. It's a different type of project. 
uh, that uh, Louisiana and many other states are facing issues load rating them because you go and load rate them because you are asked to do and they do not pass. In Louisiana, we have a special issue with it. Uh, and that is that the corner joints that you see over here are not reinforced on both sides, only reinforced on the bottom or inside side of the wall, but you don't have top reinforcement to resist negative moments, which is what you need if you want to develop continuity between the grids. So what would a designer do if they're trying to load rate this? They will assume that there is a hinge there. You assume that there is a hinge there, then the positive moments are going to increase in the middle of the spans and you get low rating values. So you go and check these uh, culverts and they are performing very well. So there is no issue there. So what is happening? So uh, we were tasked with uh, basically load testing eight cast in place reinforced concrete box culverts. They selected them. We instrumented one exterior and one interior barrel. 48 sensors uh, in total were installed, different type, not vibrating wire gauges this time. And uh, we just ran uh, trucks over this very slow. So we're not talking about dynamic. We tried to get some dynamic effect, but it doesn't feel it. It's very hard for a loaded truck to run and get up to speed in the, with the maintenance of traffic uh, that you can uh, you know, implement there. So they cannot get. So we got maybe 35 miles per hour and still nothing uh, to be sensed almost. So these are the culverts all over Louisiana, close to Texas from the Northeast to New Orleans in the uh, Northwest to uh, New Orleans in the Southeast. And the common thing for all of them, low fill. Low fill is what uh, basically uh, exacerbates the live load effect because it's more concentrated on a smaller area of the, uh, of the culvert. And as you can see, these culverts are from way back then. This is 1957. This one here, it says 2012, but there is also 1939. So this is an old culvert that because of widening of the road, they had an addition to it in 2012. We tested the 1931 one. And basically this is a very quick in, quick out job. So you have to go in and install your sensors early in the morning, start maybe at seven or earlier. You're ready, the uh, trucks will come and the maintenance, maintenance of traffic will take place. You run it and you're out by noon or maybe 1 p.m. So what did we do with this, these results? Well, we, uh, we uh, built finite element models of each of the culverts that we tested. And these models were also loaded with trucks similar in weight and configuration to what you have here. And then we uh, compared the results and we had to go through iterations of calibrating this, uh, uh, this model to minimize the differences in these peaks. And we're not focusing on one sensors, we're doing it collectively over multiple sensors that are affected by the path that you are looking at. And then for another path, there will be another set of sensors that you focus on. Because you want to consider a faraway sensor that is reading maybe five or six micro strains. And then if you get eight, then you are talking about a huge difference. Now we're talking about something that is uh, reading substantial amount of information. Once we were comfortable with the models after the calibration, we ran the different types of trucks that are needed for load rating on our models. And these uh, uh, results is, are what you can see here. Each one of them would give you the moments and the shear forces. And I'm glad I'm not the person doing all these number crunchings, but I have uh, excellent students that were uh, really involved in it and did a great job. And for that, you can now find the load rating uh, for your bridge. And you can see that the rating factors are all above one. Nothing like the zeros or the point one that you would get when you're following uh, the instructions verbatim. Uh, but now with load testing, instruction health monitoring, we can say confidently that this is not an issue. So this is the uh, SHM projects that we uh, uh, were involved in. Hany asked me to touch on the undergraduate effort, undergraduate education effort that we uh, 
we had, and he uh, served us uh, on the advisory panel. So this was uh, basically uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And the idea here is that um, our curriculum in civil engineering, especially undergraduate curriculum, is basically uh, very uh, packed. It's very hard to change anything. And uh, there are turf wars, there are like uh, classical things that people do not believe should be removed ever. And uh, structural health monitoring field measurements is something new that we think, we believe students should be uh, aware of so that when they graduate, maybe they can work. I've seen a, a DOT uh, announcing a, a job uh, ad uh, on structural health monitoring, it looks like they are forming a department and they want people that can do structural health monitoring for them. Not only that, uh, you cannot add hours. You are asked to reduce the number of hours. So our uh, model here with, with this pilot project is to develop a different way of reproducing the material. And we picked structural health monitoring because Field measurements is not just for structural engineering. Geotech do the same thing. Uh, water people, environmental people, they all have field measurements. But we are we started with structural health monitoring. So the goal of the project is to raise awareness. So the students, if they graduate in the classical curriculum, they may not even hear the word structural health monitoring. But now they will be uh, at least introduced to it. Some students get interested by this and they pursue graduate uh, uh, school uh, and then we wanted to know what resources are available and to provide a, a basic understanding of the fundamentals and applications of that all of this will be done within core existing core structural engineering courses and i will show you that in a second so the objectives were to develop something that can be reasonably implemented by faculty not just in our schools but all over, as you will see at the end, this is public information that people can uh, uh, download and use if they wish. Uh, and they are, should be consistent with the uh, level of knowledge that the students have within the time constraints that the students and the existing courses also have. Uh, and it has to be adaptable. So you take, maybe you don't want to cover all what we develop, maybe only parts of it, that's also possible. And we are open to having a faculty learning community that can contribute to this and uh, develop it further. So basically, and I was new to this information, um, I go and teach. This is how I was taught and this is how I used to teach. Now it turns out that if you are getting into education, then you have to go by some uh, basically agreed upon ways of developing this knowledge. So this is Bloom's taxonomy that tells you that there are levels of uh, basically uh, cognitive uh, you know, capabilities for students and you have to start at the bottom and build on it until you get to the person who is basically independent can develop whatever he or she wants to do based on the information that they develop there. So we start with basically memorizing facts. You know your colors, you know your numbers, that's just remembering things. And then you understand why is this happening? Why is that? Then you learn how to apply this knowledge, analyze it, evaluate it, and so on. So the modules are developed to go gradually and meet these uh, learning outcomes from the uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, we have time constraints. We had to work with other faculty to implement this in their courses. And uh, this is what has been developed. Uh, eight modules with an introductory module or, that you see over here. And then each one of these modules has a way of being implemented. So they do a lot of reading before uh, class, as you can see. And uh, then we have a discussion. So it's like a flipped classroom kind of thing that you develop. And then at the end, you are done. Uh, this was implemented in six schools, uh, LSU, University of Louisiana Lafayette, Virginia Tech, uh, University of North Florida, Tuskegee, Case Western. Um, in these years, we are planning to continue that. All of this material is available if anyone is interested, uh, including one that is in a learning management system called Moodle that we have here at LSU. We are going to provide you with everything that you need, including how we develop this hands-on model. 
that uh, ended up being a PVC beam, and I can't explain why, but I think I'm running out of time. Uh, all the dimensions, where to get it from, and we have a portal for this project that you can visit, uh, or you can send me an email, I can uh, send you the link. Uh, so this is the portal. If you're a faculty, you can go in and get these instructional resources and modify them. For students, there are the resources, but they are not uh, password protected and they are not editable. Basically, they're gonna download something that is uh, basically at the end of it. There are so many people that I have to acknowledge. I'm not gonna run through the names, but from MTRC that manages these projects for us to the DOT that basically are the instigators behind many of these projects to contractors, and then the excellent graduate students that uh, worked with me on these projects. And uh, finally, my colleagues that uh, got me into education, uh, Dr. Dupu and Dr. Seals. With that, I hope that I have not run my time by much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your patience and attention. And uh, I'm glad to be answering any questions. Yeah, Thank we're you. actually right on time. And we have, um, so, so, <clears throat> so we have the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so for questions and answer. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll start to answer the questions in the order they come in. I guess uh, in the meantime, as people are preparing their questions, I was curious to hear, uh, and either you or Professor Nassif can weigh in here, but what, what comes next for this research, for you, for the field, or anything else that you're excited about that's on, on your horizon? Thank you, John. I, I think uh, this Ayman showed a very, very important aspect of structural health monitoring. Like it can give answers whenever there are issues that the regular code or the regular design procedures do not really shed good light. Uh, he was able to solve a couple of the issues using this, this uh, simple way of monitoring and, and, and processing the data. So I think that's, that shows how structural health monitoring is not it shouldn't be ubiquitous to every, uh, you know, bridge. But uh, there are issues. There are things that, uh, you know, it, it can it get repeated, and and you know, the same problems are popping up in different states. I think uh, this structural health modeling can shed more light. Uh, Ayman, I just have a question. I think about from the material side. I mean, we're working with our New Jersey DOT, and we're developing uh, ultra high performance concrete. Uh, you know, for various applications. And one of them, we are thinking about the link slab. I wonder if this link slab that you have tested, if the material was used there, and maybe perhaps you could, you could follow up on your finite element model, if you have used the ultra high performance concrete as a material for the link slab, uh, would that have made a difference in the behavior? Because it seems like it's temperature driven uh, with the gradient. I, I didn't show the cracking that we uh, what, that we captured in the link slab, but there there were cracks. I mean, this is going to happen because of live load, and you have tension at the top of this uh, link slab right. piece. So I think with ultra high performance concrete, then I didn't do research on ultra high performance concrete, but I think it will be more distributed. Our conclusion, by the way, I didn't mention that that this groove that uh, you are put there to arrest the crack doesn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. The crack is going to escape. Uh, it has a mind of its own. Maybe it goes in the groove for a little bit, and then it goes away, and then comes back in. So the crack will take place. So if ultra high performance concrete can distribute this crack instead of having just one, you have you know like the multiple micro cracks that uh, can happen or not. Then I think that would be a much better performance for a link slab. Yeah. Thank you. So it looks like we have a practitioner question here. So um, this person asks, what adjustments to the sensor set up for the simply supported spans that you presented? So what adjustments for those would need to be made, if any, when seismic cable rest restrainers are installed connecting the beams over, over a pier? All right, so I guess I'll have to look at the detail to see how the seismic uh, restrainers are uh, connected to the girder. Um, if the if these are going to kick in even under small deformation due to temperature or live load, then I think you have to put the sensors the same way I've put them because they are going to be part of the uh, of the behavior. But if they are maybe uh, not as tight, that will only kick in at larger deformations, 
then uh, maybe there, there will be some adjustment that needs to be uh, taken into account there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, what, so what are some challenges about adopting these technologies um, that, that you've encountered or that agencies that you're working with are encountering? All right, so I, I think I, I touched on how we approached these two projects. The first one, we came after the fact. The bridge was already under construction. It was a, you know, a expedited job. Just can, can you just do this before they pour the girders, before they pour the deck? And I'll tell you one challenge that I faced. Uh, we lost one girder. It was rejected when it went to the uh, construction site and they basically threw it away with my sensors in it. I lost about $10,000 of sensors in there because this was the structure health monitoring piece was not part of the uh, bidding documents for the project. I couldn't ask for anything. And we had to scramble the following day once we uh, got the news that we lost the girder, they were pouring the uh, substitute or the replacement girder the following day. So I just had to find sensors and 24 hours rush install them, I didn't have the same number of sensors. So this is the experience with the first project. Second project, we, we learned from our lesson, and it was part of the, it was a change order. So now the contractor had to accommodate us, basically. The first contractor accommodated us, but of course, if something goes wrong and they are now under the gun, they had to do their thing. But this second project, there was, uh, uh, it was a change order. So basically they were asking us, should we proceed? Should we do this? We were part of the decision-making and that made a huge difference. Yeah, Great, I think thank you. Are, yeah, I, I agree. These are some, some issues that you know, come up, especially when you're trying to implement, uh, you, know, you have to follow the, the schedule of the, of the construction on the site with the contractor constraints. So these are practical issues. So, so both of you are working with um, agencies uh, often on these very large projects. I was, I was curious to hear, especially since you're involved in this educational project, what are the best ways in your view for providing continuing workforce development for, for agency practitioners? I mean, these things are changing all the time and there's quite a lot to catch up on. Uh, there was a call for proposals by the Federal Highway Administration to address something like this last summer, I, I would say. And I think there were a couple of projects that um, they are just starting that look into this. How do you develop? We, we have our ideas of how to do this for, you know, like the people who are currently practicing and they would like to get into structural health monitoring instead of having to do everything on their own. Maybe there is a formal way of uh, breaking them in, basically. And uh, so I suggest that uh, people who are interested, if they go and look at the Federal High uh, FHWA's website for research projects, the call from last, I think there are two projects that were funded for, uh, up for education. So when are the outcomes going to come from these projects? Um, probably not, not in the next six months or a year. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Federal Highway is doing a good effort in that sense because this is very much needed and albeit, you know, we have enough, we, there are companies there that are leading the charge. However, the, the, uh, the cost is still uh, uh, very high to find someone within the agencies that can maintain, collect the data, process the data. You know, you don't need a PhD to always do that. So I think, in my opinion, that's why I asked Ayman, and I like what they have done in, their, in terms of their curriculum, is that we need to breed civil engineering students that are capable of at least understanding what it takes to, you know, to, to use the sensors, to, to what kind of sensors are applicable. Uh, we teach that in, in some of our courses, but it's not yet at a level where you know, we feel like, okay, you know, we gave it enough so that we can graduate students who are very well aware. Uh, as, as Ayman mentioned, the curriculum is being squeezed from all direction. And I think, you know, somehow we need to go to the five-year program. Uh, and we implemented that in our, our department is we have a, a four-year bachelor's degree and a one-year master's degree. They can do it together and do a five-year program. And in, within that, I think there is some room for when they start talking about graduate classes, 
And I do that with all my students uh, at the master's level that in our lab, nobody graduates without learning how to you know, use some of these sensors, either in the lab or in the field. So in a way, I think that's where it should start. I, I think Fadal Highway is doing great effort and trying to do the uh, you know, training for, for uh, engineers and how to do these technologies. But I think that that you know uh, is not as as you know spread throughout the country, and it's very uh, uh, limited to locations where where people will tend to go and attend these classes. So I think the curriculum that uh, Louisiana has developed is is a very good starting point, and they made it available to everyone. And I we've been we've been looking at that uh, for a while. So I think I would encourage all the academics on, on today's call to really reach out to Ayman. And, and, and try to see if they can adopt some of the things they've done. Okay, definitely. We have time for one more question. So I guess this question is for, for both of you. Is, um, where would you want to see additional research dollars and personnel time go to make the largest impact on infrastructure resilience? Ayman, you want to do this? Hey, you want to start this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question. Let's maybe some bottlenecks. Like, what are, what are some things that are maybe are underfunded or or? I think the 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 future is bright, and with this infrastructure bill that has been passed, there is a lot of attention being given to the research aspect of it. And I think you know, hopefully, you know, if if we get this on a on a this commitment for a longer period of time, which it seems like is going to happen over the next ten years, I think there will be a lot of uh, concentration on 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 introducing technology to civil engineering. You know, we've been, as civil engineers, we've been doing classical work for quite some time. We, we love theory, we love applications, but now I think it's time for, for our agencies and for our uh, institutions like researchers to really start thinking about utilizing technologies, uh, robots, uh, MIMS, uh, small scale sensors, because this makes the, the rewards for our infrastructure uh, multiplied. So we need to start thinking about how does technology, you know, sensing, instrumentation, uh, uh, robotics, whatever, uh, you know, it, it looks like it's a, a space age, uh, you know, future type of, but it's happening. And, and I think other fields are looking into that. Uh, you know, I, I see with my students, uh, for, for example, artificial intelligence and, and uh, machine learning, all of that is happening especially with structural health monitoring, it's gonna take it to a different level. You don't need to have a, a someone sitting behind the computer to, to analyze the data. Eventually that's gonna happen you know, uh, using AI. And I think that that is where uh, a, a good direction to be. You know? Rakil, do you wanna weigh in? Uh, in addition to what Hani uh, you know, mentioned about you know, the technology and implementation, I think there is a, there is a need for um, new materials like ultra high performance concrete implementation, <clears throat> uh, things like stainless steel as reinforcement uh, to uh, prevent corrosion, um, FRP uh, as internal reinforcement. These things are on the periphery right now, and for for understandable reasons, uh, we don't want to commit. And then, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, we find that there are issues with them. So we're taking them one step at a time. And for each one of these things, how are you going to basically assess their, uh, you know, be performance in the field while structure health marketing comes back in? And uh, all of this is basically going to uh, help with uh, the resilience of our structure and the durability and all of these things. Great. So I said that was the last question, but I, I'm just kidding because we had one one more uh, question sneak in here uh, about your, your the curriculum you spoke about. How would you describe the students' acceptance of of SHM in the undergraduate curriculum? I'll tell you what I'm. I was pleasantly surprised because it's something got their attention. Uh, Structural health marketing is is part of why it got their attention. The other part is how we uh, how we presented the material. So it was not like me lecturing and, you know, they have to take notes and then solve a problem at the end, the classical approach that we all learned uh, with, but this was a flipped classroom. So they had to read about the material. They cannot come to class before like passing 
what we had the initial stage called the mastery exam, and then we said they are not masters in anything yet. So it was called the readiness exam. They are ready to start the discussion and they form groups in the classroom and they basically, you pose the question on the screen that they should have read about and then they talk to each other and then the groups start presenting. So there was like, you know, it's an active learning kind of thing. And I got a lot of positive feedback from the students about this, even though it was not my class. I was just like a guest lecturer. And I didn't mention this. The uh, way we present it is by taking two uh, class periods from the professor that is teaching the course to introduce the four of the uh, module. And then in the other course, the design course, two uh, class periods. What is the idea here? The idea is that you lose two class periods because of travel, because of you know, emergencies, because of anything. And we're gonna fill in for you. So the instructor of record is basically happy with this because somebody is gonna cover when they are not there. The students may not like it if it comes as a last minute kind of thing. Students want to know from the very beginning of the semester, what is the, uh, what am I asked to do? So we uh, emphasize that this has to be included in the, uh, 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 in the uh, syllabus so that uh, there are no surprises, there is no resistance to it. Once it's in the syllabus, they accept it. And once they come, especially this hands-on kind of thing, where we use the PVC beam. Why PVC? Because it's light. You can apply the load using your finger. We looked into timber, we looked into aluminum. They are much heavier. They require much heavier load, which is not safe with the students around it. But with a PVC board that is $20, that's it you can apply the load with maybe five pounds and it's gonna give you some decent readings. So that was our approach. I think it was a success and uh, uh, we hope that more and more people will start implementing it. All right. Thank you very much for answering all these questions and thank you everyone for asking them. My guest today is, uh, or our guest today, excuse me, it's Professor Ayman O'Keel from LSU, and Professor Hani Nassif, Associate Director of Technology Transfer at C2Smart. Uh, Professor O'Keel, Hope to see you again soon in New York, or even better, maybe we can visit you at LSU. Uh, you are welcome anytime. Crawfish season is uh, going on now, so uh, please come on down. Absolutely. Can't wait. <laughs>